as permitted by the governor's disaster declaration of January 8, 2021, the determination has been made that an in-person meeting is not practical or prudent for this committee to meet in person. To ensure a transparent and open meeting is possible, uh, we have posted the meeting materials approximately one week in advance of our meeting. Uh, we'll provide a recording of this meeting linked to our website, and we'll take all votes by a roll call. Uh, Stephanie, do we have any additional announcements before we start on our agenda? Can you hear me all right? Yes, yes. Right. We have thank you. Issues, but we will work through. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, just wanted to make it just a couple of uh, housekeeping announcements to everybody. Uh, this meeting is being recorded just so that you are aware. Uh, please use your full name in the GoToMeeting platform. Uh, please use your mute bu button uh, function uh, when you are not speaking so we can cut down on some of that background noise. And if you're a member of the public and you have questions or comments throughout the meeting, please use the chat box and we will uh, be sure to be monitoring that and, and have a space at the end of the agenda to answer any of those questions. Uh, members of the committee, when making a motion, please include your name so staff can properly record that. Um, and that concludes our uh, general housekeeping announcements, Mr. Chair. Very good. Thank you, Stephanie. Next, we'll move to the uh, approval of uh, the minutes. Uh, this time, I'll entertain a motion uh, in a second for the approval of these minutes. As uh, Stephanie stated, please state your, your name uh, when making the motion. Frank Beal, move to approve. Thank you, Frank. Sean Wydell, second. Thank you, Sean. We have a first and a second. Are there any uh, changes, corrections, or additions to the minutes? Okay, thank you. Uh, hearing none, roll call, please. Chairman Reinbold? Yes. Mayor Broly? Frank Beal? Yes. Diane Williams? Yes. Barry Cohen? Jason Keller? Yes. Nancy Furfer? Chris Schneider? Yes. And Sean Wydell. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Motion, Motion carries. Oh, I'm sorry. Was there another one? I beg your pardon. No, it passes. Uh, and we that also will serve as your um, the roll call for those present at the at the meeting as well. Very good. Uh, thank you for that reminder, Stephanie. So noted. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll move on uh, to board. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, updates. Uh, we're very fortunate today to have our executive director, Aaron Aylman, join us today. Uh, Aaron, I'd like at this time like to turn it over to you for a, a few key updates uh, for the coordinating committee. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a couple uh, ex quick announcements here because I think most of the stuff will cover on the board meeting agenda. But I wanted to highlight that we have a new deputy executive director for research analysis and programming, uh, Yusuf Salama, who joined us last week. Uh, just came on camera here, but he has a more than a decade of experience del delivering public infrastructure um, and has advanced a number of public-private partnerships through his role at PPP Canada, Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority, and most recently at Turner Townsend. So we're pleased to welcome him to the team. He fills the spot that was vacated by Jesse Elam when he went to Cook County. Um, and there'll be more opportunities, I think, to talk to, to Yusuf um, into the future as he legs under him <laughs> and gets to know the region more. So, um, hey, welcome, Yusuf. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much for the introduction, Aaron. I, I look forward to speaking and working with you all going forward. Thank you. Super. Thank you. Welcome. Um, and so uh, the other thing that I wanted to touch on with this committee here, uh, just two other quick things that we won't, uh, so that you don't hear me twice on a number of these things, is that, um, you know, you'll, you have on your agenda this morning, uh, the 2050 update process and uh, the role that this coordinating committee is going to play and the update process is pretty invaluable to us. So, you know, um, I think that one of the things that happens when we do major plans like the 2060 update or plan when we get to it is that it often takes up a lot of time and attention on our committees and we know that we have a lot of work that we want to continue to advance 
And so as, as we've talked about how to make sure that we're being efficient, getting feedback on the 2020 plan update, we really are focusing on the administrative um, the administrative update, um, but probably not changing the policy direction at this time. And so we really want to look to this committee as being sort of the landing, the home base uh, for updates, uh, projects related to the 2050 update as we move through that process over the next, I'd say, year and a half here. So you'll hear about that. Um, as there are opportunities or as there are um, notes of importance that your com committees might care about, uh, we're happy to sort of engage them in meaningful ways that are that are discreet. But we don't want this update to take over sort of all of your committee agendas moving forward. So just a note on sort of my thinking um, and the team's thinking on that. And then the last thing that I just think that I can't emphasize enough that is really great that's happened recently across the region, and I'll say this again at the board meeting because I think it's just really just phenomenal, is that you know this agency has a process by which we put our communities into one of four cohorts, and we do that based on population, by household um, income, by the abilities of communities to raise revenues themselves, and become, you know, this is how we allocate our technical assistance resources that we really want to provide the most support to communities that have the least resources and capacity. Um, recently, we've learned that IDOT has taken on our community cohort process and is offering toll credits for high capacity, low capacity cohort for communities um, to be able to provide that match for infrastructure dollars. So it's, I believe, they recognize that that's the need for low income or communities that just struggle, I think, to meet basic needs and don't have the financial wherewithal often to that project. So wanted to make sure that you all were aware of this and I'll, I'll highlight it in a board meeting, but I think it's a, it um, speaks to the, the good work that I think our team here at CMAP does over time and, and should be commended for. So um, those are my brief updates. I'm happy to answer questions uh, that you all might have. Great, thank you, Aaron. Are there any questions for Aaron? Okay, great. Thanks again for joining us, Aaron. We, we, we genuinely appreciate your input, so thank you so much, and we will see you soon at the meeting. Thank you. Uh, moving on to our, our next item, if there are no questions, the ONTO 2050 plan update, and at this time, I would like to turn it to uh, Stephanie for a, a brief overview. Stephanie. Good morning, everybody. Uh, and I'm Stephanie Pfeiffer. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of Planning here at CMAP. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the UNTO 2050 plan update. So I'm going to give you an overview of the process, um, where we're at in the process, as well as what uh, the Coordinating Committee's role is going to be. So as Aaron said, we're going to take a little bit of a different approach this year. And so I'm going to go over that a little bit with you as well. Um, so getting started on the slides, um, and we can go to the next one, Katie. Um, so on to 2050, uh, this is the document that guides all of our work that we do here at CMAP. It was adopted by the board in 2018, um, and it is uh, based on three main principles. Uh, the first principle being inclusive growth. Um, first, uh, next slide. Uh, inclusive growth for a stronger, more equitable future. Our region needs to ensure every resident and community has the ability to fully contribute to and benefit from the economy. Uh, the next principle is resilience, uh, which allows us to prepare for rapid change, uh, both known and unknown. And the third one is prioritized investment. Uh, so targeting scarce public dollars to maximize those benefits. So you've seen all these before. They hopefully are very familiar to this group in particular, uh, but these will continue to guide us through um, our, our planning phase with ONTO 2050, but also through the update. So just wanted to bring those to light again. These will still be part of everything that we're doing with the update. Um, but moving on from that, we do have to do an update. Uh, so as I said, the plan was adopted in, in 2018, and federally we're required to update certain elements of that plan every four years. Uh, so the board and the MPO policy committee must approve those changes by October um, of 2022, which is right around the corner. Uh, so the goals for this update um, include that we need to meet our federal requirements. Uh, we also need to um, update our, uh, adjust our data and performance measures to meet the current situation. So things have changed in the last uh, three years. And so we need to make those data adjustments. And then also responding to the regionally significant project requests. So those are the three main goals of this uh, this update. 
And uh, moving to the next slide, uh, there's a lot that goes into this. So this slide tries to summarize a fairly um, complex uh, project that, that we'll be undertaking. Uh, there's really nine component projects that are part of this larger update. Some of them will be sequential, as you see them on this slide, but many happen concurrently, and there'll be lots of interweaving between all of these. So uh, this really is much more of a, a iterative process as we go through this. Um, you'll see that there's a number of projects that need to sort of happen uh, right away, and those are some of the things that we actually do every day. So some of these are things that we do on an annual basis. And so those include looking at our travel model, the regional socioeconomic forecast, uh, performance uh, report, financial plan, and uh, the performance targeted indicator update. And all of these things feed into uh, the main, one of the main uh, lifts that we have for this project, which is reviewing and evaluating the regionally significant projects. And then based on those projects that impacts the updated tip and then also our uh, transportation conformity analysis. Throughout this entire process, there will be public engagement um, and all of this will culminate in an update document, uh, which will include a plan narrative as well as uh, some of those technical appendices that incorporate the other pieces. Uh, the final document will also include information that's not required, um, but is also related to our current situation. And this includes the work that we're doing in the mobility recovery, um, as well as the work that we're doing in the transportation and equity framework. Um, so this, this work will actually inform some of the changes that happen and some of the information that's provided in the projects above. So we will be coming back to this committee as we hit different milestones in, in, in any of these given projects to give you updates and get in, input and feedback. So as far as what those milestones are, uh, the next slide we shows us um, some of those some of those milestones. So you can see that we've already been spending the last year uh, really beginning work on all of those projects. So a lot of this work is already underway. Um, but we will be having a few more touch points over the next uh, year and very quickly uh, this time next year we will be looking forward to having a public comment period for all of that work. So a lot to be done in a short amount of time, but we've already uh, got a good start on that and are looking forward to bringing that to the public in next summer. So uh, moving to the next uh, the next slide, I just wanted to talk a minute about what Aaron um, brought up this morning with regards to the coordinating committee role. So uh, we're looking for the coordinating committee to, to fulfill a unique role this time around with the ONTO 2050 update. Uh, different elements will be presented uh, to the board, to the MPO, and then also to this committee um, as a means to be able to gather information, um, both from your uh, unique points of view, but also those of you that are chairs on the working committees to be able to gather that input uh, from your working committees. So what we're gonna be asking uh, the committee chairs to do in conjunction with their CMAP staff liaisons um, is to really disseminate that information to your working committees, gather feedback from them and bring that back um, either to this group, the, to this body or directly to the project managers. Um, we also really encourage you to um, encourage your uh, committee members to attend the coordinating committee. So if you see that there's an item that's on 22050 update on the agenda, and we'll make sure the staff liaisons know that as well, um, they can always attend the meeting and be able to hear those updates firsthand and, and might be able to give you uh, some more direct comment and feedback on that. But as Aaron said, the main goal here is to make sure that we're collecting all that important feedback and input, but also trying to uh, make sure that we're efficient in how we're getting that and being respectful of everyone's time in the working committees, as well as all of your time on the coordinating committee. Um, so with that, uh, that's, that, that's sort of an overview of the process, um, really is just sort of giving you a taste, but just wanted to know if there's any thoughts or questions as we, we start moving forward. Um, or any other um, questions that you might have. No questions. All right. Well, we look forward to working with all of you uh, through this process. As I said, there's a lot to be done uh, in a year and you know, really trying to take into account the, some of the changing uh, environment that we have over the last uh, year that we've uh, you know, been working through. And so I uh, look forward to talking with all of you about those updates uh, in the coming year. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
Oh, you might be on mute, uh, Mayor. You're right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving to our next topic, which is the local technical assistance project life cycle uh, workshops. At, at this time, I'd like to turn it over to staff to highlight several of the LTA projects uh, at various stages uh, in the planning process. And Stephanie, I don't know if you're going to give us the update or if we have some other staff support on this. I'm going to start us off uh, and then uh, Katie is going to take it from there. Great, so, uh, so for this item, um, what we really wanted to do was was do a little bit of a workshopping with the with the coordinating committee and um, really look at the ways that we're soliciting input and feedback from from the members of the group. Uh, we've heard uh, from lots of you that you you really like to hear about the projects that we're working on, and also that we really want to make sure that we are incorporating your thoughts throughout that process. So giving you a larger role in how we uh, build those projects and how we uh, incorporate the different principles of the ONTU 2050 into those projects. So to do that, we wanted to spend just a little bit of time this morning walking through what is the project life cycle? Where are some of those existing points of contact for the coordinating committee and the working committees? And so this, this is really looking at all the committees and not just the coordinating committee. So we can talk about both of those this morning, uh, but really looking at what is that project life cycle? Where are we currently getting that feedback and input? And where are some other opportunities to be able to add some additional input uh, into the process, both based on where they might be the most helpful or might be uh, the most informative for the groups in the work that they're doing. So what we're going to do this morning is just walk through through these. We're going to use some existing projects as our examples. Uh, we figured instead of just walking through the different phases, we would actually walk through the phases with the real time projects that are going on right now. Um, so the, what you have in front of you on the slide, this is the, the sort of the general project um, life cycle. So I'm going to just walk through this real quickly um, and, and just talk about where we currently get that input. So first off is just the project development phase. And so the main place that the coordinating committee um, has line of sight to this part of the project part of the process is in project selection. So as you know, when we do the call for projects, we, we typically come to the coordinating committee, walk through sort of what our goals and objectives are for that year, for that that call for projects, as well as what some of that criteria we're gonna be looking at as we do project selection. Uh, we also reach out to individual members if they have a relationship with a particular community, just to learn more about what the opportunities might be there at that community. And so we, we do have sort of an established um, touch point with all of the working committees for that project selection. But then we go through sort of scope development, a phase where we're getting to know the community, doing data analysis, doing some visioning. And then currently the next point where we really come back to the committees is at the key recommendations point. And so when we have worked with the community, figure, worked through their visioning and have a draft of sort of what we think those key recommendations are, that's when we then go back through the working group and coordinating committee and get feedback and input on those key recommendations. We then take those key recommendations and that's the basis for the plan development which uh, comes to a final deliverable and then with implementation, starting with the community approval. So that's sort of where we currently are. Um, we're gonna, we're not gonna cover those two that we currently do. What Katie's gonna cover this morning is going through some of those other pieces and some ideas that we'd like to brainstorm and have a conversation about where, where there might be some valuable input that we could get on some of those other pieces along the way. Um, so with that, Katie Petrowski uh, from uh, the CMAP planning staff is going to walk you through uh, a couple of uh, project examples. So go ahead, Katie. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Katie Petrowska, and I'm an associate planner um, here at CMAP. Um, so as Stephanie mentioned, we wanted to highlight several um, LTA projects that are currently going on to sort of uh, give you an idea of the different phases of an LTA plan. Uh, and we will use the uh, highlight to sort of have a discussion about the role that the committee could play in each of the um, project phases. So staff had put together uh, some recorded presentations that highlight different projects. And the first uh, project that we wanted to highlight is the Bartlett Streamwood Bicycle and Pedestrian Plan. Um, so I will share the presentation uh, right now, and then afterwards we'll have a discussion about uh, the role the committee could play in this phase of, the, of an LTA plan. Good morning. 
My name is Jen Maddox, and I'm going to briefly discuss the Bartlett and Streamwood Bicycle and Sorry about that. Pedestrian Plan, which just kicked off last spring. In 2018, the villages of Bartlett and Streamwood applied separately to the LTA program for village-wide bicycle and pedestrian plan assistance. CMAP saw an opportunity for a larger multi-jurisdictional plan, and the communities agreed to embark on a planning process together. This plan is a result of that commitment to collaboration. The planning area is focused on the neighboring communities on the northwest side of our region. In addition to the entirety of both villages, the study area includes metro stations and pace bus routes and multiple forest preserves. The villages of Bartlett and Streamwood both have partial bicycle and pedestrian networks, which consist almost exclusively of off-street trails, side paths, and sidewalks. Barriers in the form of large arterial roadways, rail lines, waterways, utility easements, industrial zones, preserved and undeveloped areas, and even subdivision boundaries separate some parts of each of the villages from the others and make bicycling and walking to certain destinations challenging. We are in the beginning phases of developing a community-driven plan to improve safety, access, and connectivity for pedestrians, cyclists, seniors, children, and people with disabilities. The plan will identify existing and planned bicycle and pedestrian facilities, as well as major gaps, barriers, and opportunities for new bikeways and pedestrian connections. The plan will propose a network of infrastructure improvements that spans the villages and connects to key destinations, existing and planned facilities, as well as to regional trails and transit stations. Throughout the planning process, we aim to engage a diverse range of stakeholders to build consensus around the future vision and goals for Bartlett and Streamwood. We will identify engagement strategies and education opportunities designed to serve both existing users and to encourage more people to walk, bike, and use transit. Finally, the plan will identify specific action items, next steps, relevant partners, and funding opportunities to help guide implementation of the plan's recommendations toward a system that works better for everyone. At this point, we formed a committee of stakeholders to steer the plan's directions and are in the initial stages of community outreach and data analysis. The plan's engagement website launched right before the Memorial Day weekend, and we've already received about 25 comments. The website is available in both English and Spanish, and it allows for interactive engagement through maps and surveys, in addition to general plan information. The plan is on schedule to be drafted by next spring with adoption in summer 2022. We hope you'll join us at our first public meeting on June 24th. Please spread the word to your networks. And in the meantime, take a look at our engagement website and please share your ideas. Thank you. Okay, uh, so that's an example of a plan that's you know in the beginning stages um, of our of our LTA planning phase, um, and I guess to to get us started with some discussion questions, um, you know how can CMAP better engage the committee to help seed projects uh, during the plan development phase that uh, Stephanie mentioned in her in her timeline, and is there an expanded role for the committee uh, to play in the scoping of a project? So we'd welcome any thoughts on, on those questions or um, or any other questions you may have about uh, this particular project. Thank you, Katie. Questions, uh, comments for Katie? Any thoughts on, on how we can uh, support uh, what our staff is doing or, or give some additional input? And maybe I'll just get us started too with a couple ideas that we've been tossing around and maybe that'll get, get some of the juices flowing here early on, on a Wednesday morning. Um, so this this project, one of the reasons we picked it is that they this these two communities originally came into us with two separate um, project applications. And they're communities that are right next door to each other asking for the exact same thing, but they didn't realize that the other community was interested in doing the same type of project. And so this is a really good example of where we reached out to contacts, um, some of which were through our committees, and we're able to, to get those communities at the table together and come together for one cohesive plan. And so that's an example of where um, we can get some additional value, I think, from all the relationships that you all have, and that perhaps maybe one of the ideas is that we share with the commit the working committees and this committee some of those initial applications just to see if you have any existing relationships or thoughts on that. And we make that a little bit more of a formal process. Um, but also just this part about this, the steering committee. So I think the other piece of that uh, that Katie mentioned is we've started 
creating those steering committees, but utilizing your networks to say, are there other individuals either based on the topic, even if they're not necessarily related to the community, but because of the topics that the community wants to cover that, that would be helpful to have on those steering committees? Or do you all have relationships in those communities so that we can um, add those individuals to the steering committee? Um, and then lastly, are there things we're missing? You guys all have a much better point of view as to what some of the issues and some of the concerns that are going on in some of the communities that you are involved with. And so you can even provide insight to us as we're developing that scope of maybe some of those things that we should keep an eye out for, or some of the ideas of things you're seeing in your community. So those are just some ideas that we were um, throwing around just to, to get some maybe some of the thoughts going with the rest of the group. Stephanie, one, one thought might be when, when we announce the LTA uh, opening for applications that, that we may make, we might want to make a special mention that we're uh, looking for communities and, and organizations to partner on, on projects that can be uh, mutually beneficial. That, that might just help at a local level um, to advance discussions to, to see it. And if, if we could in the process, uh, mentioned that we we would give special considerations for those type of projects that um, benefit multiple jurisdiction or interests. Great. Mm -hmm. And Stephanie, this is Jason. Can you hear me okay? Yes. You don't sound like right. Darth Vader. Um, yeah, I know. I I, I remember that viv vividly. Uh, <laughs> so so two pieces of feedback. Uh, thank you thank you for this information. And and I I concur with uh, the feedback provided thus far of of providing emphasis to multi jurisdictional approaches. Um, I would also put emphasis towards uh, communities that are uh, I would say at least fifty percent lower moderate income or have have benefit to lower moderate moderate income that are. 50% is just a number that we use from the federal government side, but you know, you, you can pick a number that's reasonable based on the jurisdictions that we serve. But but really my, my feedback is is really post LTA. You know, I have, having sat on these committees for, for several years and going through the application process and listening to all the great ideas and all the selections that, that come through, no no feedback on that. But but I don't ever really know what happens. I I, I don't I don't know if there's a way to have a look back. Um, you know, would, would there be one coordinating committee each year that is dedicated to uh, the LTAs from 2019? And then, you know, saying, all right, it's been it's been 24 months. That what, what what has CMAP's work done? What what has been the deliverable? How has the community responded? What are the lessons learned? Uh, were there constituents not at the table that that could have been? I, I, I guess I I would personally get value out of a look back more so than providing any feedback up front because. Again, your process is very sound to me. Uh, it, 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 it encapsulates a lot of different things that we would think about too. So nothing, no, no feedback on the front end. I would just suggest some sort of feedback, either opportunity to provide feedback on the back end or maybe even bringing in the awardees themselves for 24 months and saying, oh, wow, CMAP, thank you so much for what you did on this, on this new bike path. It's been 24 months. Let, let's, tell, let's tell the coordinating, coordinating committee what happened. Let you know. Here, here's the result of your work. So I'll I'll stop there. But that that would be my feedback for this morning. It's a great idea. Thank you, Jason. Um, I do have one question too. Uh, once you finish the plans, which you do, and then you have them adopted by the community, is there any thought giving to making sure that at least they are beginning to implement? Maybe they might need some help with kicking off the first piece of it to make sure that it actually happens. Yes, yeah, so thank you both for, for bringing up implementation. Um, as, as my team knows, we, we put implementation almost in every statement we do now. Uh, that was one of, um, one of my uh, goals in, in coming on board is really, you know, not having those plans sit on the shelf. And so uh, actually, uh, so I love the ideas of coming back to the coordinating committee, sort of having that, that regular check-in. Um, and then in direct answer to your question, Nancy, so we are uh, with a lot of our embedded staff planner programs, that's where we're trying to take it to that next level. Uh, so we do have a number of new programs, they are new, so we're still sort of trying things out and seeing how we can get there. But exactly what you said is what we found is that it, we need to be there longer. We need to be there through uh, the first year to two years after a plan to really help keep that focus. And it's not even just 
um, about that the communities don't have the desire to move the, the elements of the plan forward. It's just that they need that capacity to move that plan forward, especially as we are focusing on those communities that don't have as much uh, capacity. But I actually, I wanna bring that back to uh, one of the things I was hoping to get out of this committee with regards to the, the beginning of the process, because I um, adamantly believe that implementation starts with the very first contact of the community. And so one of the things that, that I'm hoping to do is actually to bake more implementation into every phase of that life cycle that you saw. Um, and I think by building more champions up front at the very beginning of the project is the way that we're going to have a successful implementation at the end. And so um, some of those examples that I gave you are things that we have been um, thinking about in terms of how can we build stronger relationships from the beginning, get the right people at the table um, from the beginning on those steering committees and not just the people that have an opinion because of course we want to hear people who have an opinion but those people that are willing to to be in it for the long haul and be the champions for the work after the planning process is done and we need to engage those individuals um, from the beginning but we need your help to really figure out who are those right individuals to make sure that we're including them, even if it's just you need this type of person, and then we can do some of the legwork to make sure we have that type of person. But yes, implementation, implementation, implementation. Stephanie, when, when we're talking about this this look back, whether it be two years or even even longer, uh, is is there uh, an opportunity, perhaps? to identify projects where implementation didn't happen and kind of do a, a analysis or a drill down on what, you know, what is that, what is that gap? I know earlier you had mentioned they might not have staffing, uh, but just take a look and, and see, I, overwhelmingly the projects have been successful and very positive, uh, but there may be a, a small number of projects that didn't advance uh, and just take a look at what, you know, what can we do to uh, ensure that uh, the work that CMAP puts into these LTA projects is, is genuinely of benefit to, to the community. Yeah, agreed. I think that's a, that's a great idea, and we can certainly pull that together. We've actually done some of that analysis already, and so I'll actually make a note that at our upcoming coordinated committee, we can go through at least the preliminary look that we've already done. We did that through sort of figuring out how to shape that embed staff planner program. So, so we can talk through sort of what we've done so far, but I think that's a great idea really to go back and look at each of the projects. Um, while I, I do um, appreciate the vote of confidence that we've had great implementation in our plans, um, it's never enough implementation. So uh, we will constantly be striving for more. And so, yeah, I think that taking a look back would be a really good thing to see what those pieces are. But we're also uh, really looking forward as to what are those things that are really working. So looking at our success in Sauk Village, Calumet Park, and then now we have um, 16 new communities that we're going into with our implementation uh, program. And so we'll be able to report back to the committee uh, over the next uh, probably eight months. We'll have some good feedback from those projects. So I think that will actually um, give us even more fodder for being able to think about how to improve that implementation. Great. And just and then I'll, I'll uh, turn it over for additional input. But one other thought I had is uh, when we have these applications, the LTA applications, there's there's uh, a lot of good projects that simply don't make the cut, but are very, very close and, and needed. Uh, is there a way to mentor uh, these applicants to help them refine their application so so next round uh, it has a better chance of being approved yes that's a that's a great idea we we have done that informally with certain communities but uh, that's a good idea to really formalize that a bit more um, and then one of the other ideas that I'd love uh, thoughts back on is we've been um, thinking about and this sort of ties into that project development phase is that perhaps a better way to go instead of doing you know fewer projects that are really uh, very complex and long are we better off doing more projects that are possibly shorter term um, and something that really just gets the ball rolling for a community so in other words instead of doing a three-year uh, project with a community which will still do some of those but do we do more 
sequencing of smaller six to eight month projects with the community. And maybe uh, once we sequence them, we, we're still in that community for three years, but maybe it's it's a smaller uh, piece that we can then help, you know, sort of more communities uh, and be more flexible with their uh, capacity. Any thoughts on that idea? So I, well, this is, this is oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Jason, I'll wait. Oh, I'm sorry, Diane, very, That's very okay. quickly. You know, I, I also wonder if it might be helpful to to flag those that have a broader potential for a broader regional benefit versus a bike path for for Streamwood and Bartlett, right? So so that's good for those communities. No no objection, no no feedback. But something you know maybe a flag for this committee that says yes, out of the twenty applications, these two really really have the impact for a, a broader regional benefit that that we could highlight either in our annual report or something else in the LTA process of, as a whole versus benefiting two two communities or a singular community. Sorry, go ahead, Diane. No, I think that makes perfect sense, Jason. Thanks thanks for that comment. I, I just I just want to emphasize how important it is that we don't sort of switch one focus for the other, but that in fact we do blend them. Because there are communities that without the commitment for the long haul really won't be able to take it to whatever the next step is. But I really do like the idea of some of the shorter ones that I guess from my perspective while they will certainly be communities that I'm going to say need support, but hopefully we can also work with some of those communities um, that are not as needy um, as maybe our initial tier is right now, but could get there if they don't get any help. And so I've, I've always been concerned about that particular sort of middle group of communities that may be doing okay today, but they are just sort of just doing okay. And I think sometimes they get left sort of out of the fray. And we need to make sure that they are also included to avoid them falling into a different situation. Good point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. Further comments or questions? This is a good discussion. Thank you. I, I just one further thought. And, and referring to the bike project that you have going, when you said there's some barriers, that, you know, in doing this, such as railroad tracks and you know barriers such as that can you pull out some of those and have like a this is how you overcome it which other communities can use in other words, solutions for some of those barriers that you can share with other communities that probably have the same barriers Absolutely, absolutely, and and we we uh, especially with those particular issues, um, we're trying to build more of our um, collaborations. So, how do we build communities that have like challenges to be able to you know fight those challenges together? And so, yeah, absolutely, Nancy, absolutely. Great. If anything else on this topic, any other comments or input? Okay, very good. Good discussion. Thank you, everyone. Uh, next is committee updates. Oh, so. <laughs> oh I'm sorry. Actually, we have we have a couple more projects we're going to share with you. Oh, uh, Mary. oh okay. Yeah. I apologize. No, we love to hear it. Please uh, keep it coming. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So this was uh, just the first kind of phase of an LTA plan, uh, but our second phase, the uh, getting to know the community uh, phase, and uh, project that's currently in this particular um, phase is the Hegwish neighborhood plan. So we'll do the same thing. I'll, I'll play the uh, recording that Scott had put together, and then we'll have a discussion about what the committee, uh, what, what role the committee could play um, in the getting to know the community phase. Great, thank you. Hello, this is Stephen Ostrander, and I'm a senior planner here at CMAP, and I wanted to introduce you to the Hegwich Neighborhood Plan, which got underway just at the beginning of this year. Hegwich is sometimes called Chicago's forgotten or hidden neighborhood, and this is because it's located in the far southeastern corner of Chicago, and it's separated from its neighbors by freeways, railways, industrial areas, lakes, and natural areas. Many older residents consider Hegwich's glory days to be decades ago during the height of the steel industry. They remember it as a time when Local jobs were plentiful, neighbors knew each other well, and its commercial streets buzzed with activity, especially when after work when steel workers hit the local, the many, many local taverns operating. 
Several residents served in World War II, a time when Hegrich's Press Steel Car Company helped the war effort by switching from making railroad cars to making howitzer tanks and other military vehicles. Hegwich, as you can imagine, was hit especially hard by the decline of the steel industry uh, in the 1970s and 1980s. And over the decades, many residents with deep roots in the community have departed, often choosing to relocate to nearby Indiana. At the same time, Hegwich has balanced out some of its population losses with an influx of Hispanic residents some of whom have been proud residents of Hegwich for more than a half century. Today, Hegwich is approximately 56% Hispanic. But while Hegwich's demographics may have changed, newer residents appear to share many of the same values as older residents. They, all, they also cherish its quiet, small-town feel and like to highlight that Hegwich is often ranked as having the lowest crime rate in the city of Chicago. It is clear that Hegwich's commercial corridor has seen better days with a, a greatly depleted number of commercial businesses even before the pandemic. One of the greatest challenges is that Indiana is literally on the other side of Hegwich's eastern boundary. Many people who we've interviewed thus far have said things along the lines of, what are you supposed to do when everything is cheaper right next door. Um, they admit to getting their groceries and gas in Hammond, Indiana, and heading over to the city of Whiting, located just across Wolf Lake, to go out and eat and have fun with their families. So, Hegwish has plenty of challenges, but it also has a lot of charm. CMAP is working with the Hegwich Business Association and Alderwoman Susan Sadlowski Garza over the next two years to develop a neighborhood plan that will help guide choices and decisions that are made in the future. The plan will primarily focus on how to make Hegwich's commercial corridor a vibrant place where people want to be. It will identify feasible economic development opportunities as well as smart streetscape and placemaking strategies that will help the commercial corridor reach its potential. We also expect to recommend strategies to help Hegwich better leverage its valuable natural and recreational areas, as well as make the neighborhood better for pedestrians and biking. In particular, we are looking at ways to strengthen the connection between Hegwich's commercial corridor and the recreational areas around Wolf Lake. In our stakeholder interviews, we've also been struck by how many people have noted the lack of things for young people to do. While Hegwish has some notable sports programs for younger kids, there are a few other activities, especially for high school age teens. So we plan to look at what's being done in other city neighborhoods and nearby communities and make some recommendations in that area. Last, a key challenge keeps coming up. Uh, in our interviews thus far. While Hegwich residents, both old timers and newcomers, are united in their affection for its small town character, many feel that they don't know their fellow neighborhood residents and they wish they did. Our team knows that we're going to have to go that extra mile to reach people where they are in this community. Fortunately, our community engagement strategy is scheduled to get fully underway early this fall by when pandemic restrictions should be lifted. In short, this plan, the first of its kind ever in Hegwich, could do two important things. It can provide wise guidance that reflects and addresses the community's priorities and vision for the neighborhood's future. But perhaps more important, it is an opportunity to engage and bring together Hegwich's residents in common purpose. Thank you. Okay, so um, that's the Hegwish neighborhood plan currently in the getting to know the community phase. Um, so in terms of discussion, we wanted to get your thoughts on uh, what role the committee could play in this particular phase of, of an LTA project 
And how can the committee help establish relationships with uh, key organizations or stakeholders in a study area? And I think we've touched on this a little bit in our previous discussion, but um, are there any thoughts on, on these topics? I think our earlier comments about, you know, identifying people that we might know of have worked with uh, on other projects is, is a great way to think about how we can help. It, you know, it helps to position uh, CMAP in, in the work. But, but, but I have to say, I'm really impressed with what we just witnessed in terms of the, the overview of the project and that sort of thing. I, from my perspective or the time I've been on the board, this is a slightly different approach for us to sort of take this kind of a look at a community and, and really, I'm going to say, lead with economic development and the other pieces sort of follow. Uh, and I absolutely think this, this has the potential to be incredibly helpful to that community and to communities like Hedwish. Um, and and with, there's so many of them that are along that corridor that were negatively impacted as the steel mills closed up and those kinds of um, the, the sort of uh, ancillary businesses associated with them closed up as well. So there's a huge need for that kind of support in that whole corridor. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting project. I'm actually on that project team. Uh, and as, as Stephen mentioned, you know, we, we've been doing stakeholder interviews uh, throughout the community and, and we keep hearing how you know, difficult it is to be next to Indiana in terms of uh, getting economic development um, in the area. So I think that'll be a good challenge for us to you know, think of, of ways and strategies to, to help residents out there um, you know, get the economic development uh, opportunities that they, they deserve. So. I think, I think our chair knows a lot about those, and so do all of us in the south suburbs, um, being yes. close to Will County and Indiana, and, and how easy it is for those communities to, to just offer a different set of incentives or have a different approach to taxes, and then we struggle to try to get those, those the interest in our communities. So, yeah, that's, that's a real challenge. Yes, it absolutely is, Diane. Thank you. One, one uh, thought is um, when we're uh, talking about economic development for this particular region, we might want to reach out uh, to the Southland Development Authority to just see if they might have some input or ideas or um, thoughts on. Uh, I see Diane smiling. I, I know she's a, a big participant and supporter of the S SDA serves as our, as our chair. Um, but it, just a thought. Uh, when we're looking, if we're looking at input from potential partners, I think the SDA might be able to bring something to the table. I actually think that's a great idea. Rick is also involved with the SDA, as is Frank. Um, and, it, and it is hard for me through some of these not to just bring up SDA <laughs> as, as we think about these things, because I, I do think that it would be maybe nice at some point for us to host sort of just a brainstorming meeting where we talk about, you know, the, these kinds of projects the CMAP is doing. We kind of share some of the things that SDA is doing and see where it might make sense for us to do, to work together. Great idea. Thank you. Yeah, I like that a lot. And I do want to just um, draw attention to two things. One, um, uh, well, really, maybe just one thing. Uh, but so sort of speaking to Jason and Nancy earlier about sort of what is that regional benefit? And one of the reasons we wanted to highlight this project is because I do think that while we're going into one community, there is a huge regional benefit in what we're going to learn in this community, the approaches we're going to take that can have impact on the entire Southland and that they have those same challenges. And so, so I'm glad that you you brought that up. And, and that is one of the things where I think it can be really helpful to know, you know, what is this community seeing right now? But there's other communities on that spectrum, Diane, as you said, like some that maybe aren't there yet, some that are maybe um, have more challenges than this particular neighborhood. And how can we make sure that whatever we're coming up with here sort of addresses all of that so that we can have a document and have things that we can sort of share throughout the region when we're looking at economic development in the area? I'd just like to point, point out that <clears throat> The Southland Development Authority was the uh, happy recipient of LTA assistance early on in its uh, development, and uh, I would call that one of the successful LTA projects that has been implemented. So, thank you again, CMAP. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Good point. Thank you, Frank. Any other right. uh, comments or thoughts? I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say the same thing, Mayor. We've got one more okay. for you, unless there's other comments. Okay, yeah, thanks for preventing me from getting out over my skis. So, yes, our next one. Thank you. 
Yep. So actually, we have two more. We have this one, and then uh, the implementation phase at the end. Um, Wonderful. So, so our next phase uh, is the plan development uh, phase, and a project that's currently in this in this phase is the Burlington Comprehensive Plan. Uh, so I will uh, play the recording that Jared Patton put together, um, and then we'll have a discussion. Hi, everyone. My name is Jerry Patton. I'm an associate planner here at CMAP, and I'm going to spend the next few minutes walking you through the Burlington Comprehensive Plan. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Burlington, it's a small community of about 600 residents located in northwestern Kane County, and it's pretty well known for its small town feel. The village has a well-defined main street that's home to some local bars and restaurants, and Burlington itself is pretty walkable. It's a rural town, so if you're leaving Burlington, you need to drive, but within town, most people prefer to get around on foot, which is pretty interesting. Now, the village first came to us to ask for help with the comprehensive plan, in part because Burlington's at a pretty pivotal point in its history. For the last couple decades, population forecasts have been saying there'd be a lot of growth in the area, and the village annexed a, quite a bit of agricultural land to prepare for that growth, but it never really came. Now, there are a couple reasons why that growth didn't occur. Um, in part, the housing market just never really recovered from the 2008 recession. But also, Burlington doesn't currently have a municipal sewer system. Instead, all of the buildings in town are on septic, which really constrains both the type and the amount of development that can happen. In recent years, the village has made getting a sewer system a top priority, and they're seeking state and federal grants to make it happen. And they're confident it will. Uh, and when you're looking at a community of Burlington size, even a moderate amount of development can really change the character of the area. So one of our overarching goals for this project is to build a framework so that if and when that development does occur, it really enhances the things that people love about Burlington rather than replacing or erasing them. Uh, similarly, we'll also be seeking to avoid some of the potential pitfalls of rapid development. So we'll be looking at infrastructure finance and preserving natural resources. Uh, relatedly, we're also gonna be taking a look at what happens if that growth doesn't occur and if there isn't a sewer system. Absent a large influx of outside capital, how can Burlington address some of the underlying challenges they're already experiencing? Those are things like road maintenance, uh, broadband access, general accessibility. So that's where things stand today. Let's switch gears and talk about the project itself. We've been working in Burlington for just over a year now. We've completed our initial outreach and research and published an existing conditions report on our website, which I really encourage you to take a look at if you're interested in learning more. Uh, right now, we're in the recommendations development phase of the project, and we recently shared a key recommendations memo with our steering committee. Uh, we'll be meeting later this week to discuss their thoughts on that, and then we'll make edits and share that with the community at large so that people can know what we're thinking about including the final plan, even before it's published. Uh, we'll be working towards a draft plan in late summer, early fall, and wrapping up the final plan by the end of the year. So that's where things stand right now. Uh, but before I leave you, I want to say a few things about uh, the outreach that we've done for this project because it has been a major challenge, but also we've had some success coming up with new ways of doing things. Um, so outreach is really critical to comprehensive planning. The whole idea of a comp plan is to have a lot of conversations with stakeholders to develop a vision and then work backwards from that vision to figure out what steps are necessary to get you there. And it can be really hard to have those conversations remotely. Uh, 2020 was a year like no other, and we had to figure out things as we were going. So early in the pandemic, we canceled our in-person outreach and instead started having phone calls with as many people as possible. We spoke with a couple dozen residents to learn about what their priorities were and their concerns were. Uh, and then we had some webinars to reach as many people in the community as possible. Uh, and we published a website that had some interactive surveys and, and just shared information about the project. Uh, we also switched to having monthly steering committee meetings that were open to the public. They were open to that compliant and include a lot of trustees just to make sure that we're sharing as much information as possible. But all of those things are online and Burlington doesn't have broadband internet access and a lot of people in the community are online. So we also had to think about how to reach those people. Um, to do that, we uh, took a few, we did a few different things. Um, so the first one, which is what you see in the bottom right corner of your screen, is a mailer that we sent to every address in town. We were able to do that in part because it's such a small town, it wasn't cost prohibitive, uh, but we sent a flyer that explained what the project was, it connected to some online resources, and it also included a postcard that people could fill out with postage prepaid and answer two questions. What do you love about Burlington and what, if anything, would you change? 
And we got a tremendous amount of feedback from that. A lot of people were excited to, to let us know what they think. Some people wrote over the entire postcard. Uh, that was great. Uh, we also created topical posters and hung those in village halls so that when people were coming to pay their water bill or submit an application, they could learn about the project that way. And then now we're trying to think about how we can do in-person outreach over the summer. So could we do some kind of an outside event that's connected to a, another village festival? Uh, so that's where we stand right now. I'm still trying to figure out the outreach bit, but uh, we've had some successes and hopefully we can build on them. Um, I'm going to stop talking now, but I will stick around for the rest of the meeting and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, questions? Comments? So some of our discussion questions here, um, uh, you know, what type of input would the committee like to have uh, in this particular phase of an LTA plan, the plan development phase? Um, and can the coordinating committee help facilitate uh, feedback from working groups uh, during the plan development phase, which is something we talked about uh, right in the beginning of, of this uh, presentation. So for the sake of time, because we do have one more to go, um, if uh, if you guys have any comments or questions on this, we have one more and then we can we can wrap up any additional comments at that point. And so just one comment about the reaching people. If it's if it's that small a community with only 600 residents, maybe we ought to have a volunteer knock on the door campaign just to educate people. I mean, that that's one way to ensure that you can reach them all. That's yep. a great idea. That's a good point. Okay. Thank you. Let's move to the uh, the next topic, please. Okay. So the Pleasure. last uh, phase we'll be discussing is implementation, which we are already sort of discussed in the beginning. Uh, but a plan that was recently completed and is in this uh, phase is the Algonquin Carry Sub Area Plan. So I will play the recording, um, and then we can collect any feedback from you all that you might have. Good morning. My name is Dustin Galliari. And I'm here to talk to you about the Algonquin Carry Subarea Plan, currently in the plan implementation stage. In 2017, the villages of Algonquin and Carry applied to the LTA program to plan together for the future of the Route 31 corridor as some mining activities in the area began to cease. This plan is the result of that work. Uh, the mining area is focused on three mining areas on either side of Clawson Road and to the west of Route 31. Uh, it includes Fox Bluff Conservation Area and Hoffman Park, as well as downtown Algonquin and some adjacent residential neighborhoods, including some that are unincorporated. We were able to develop a community-driven vision looking out to 2035. The plan envisions that the area will be a unique destination, bringing the communities together and enhancing the surrounding neighborhoods, that it will connect to different community assets and places through a comprehensive transportation network, that it will create vibrant and green new places, and finally, uh, new improvements will continue to improve connections to the surrounding community and maintain a delicate balance of land use. The plan was adopted by the two village boards in April and May of this year. So we're now moving towards plan implementation. There are a few plan recommendations involving CMAP that I'd like to highlight for you all today for your discussion. First, uh, the plan recommends establishing an advisory committee to continue collaboration. Coordination between the villages, landowners, and other jurisdictions is a key ingredient to achieve the plan's vision. The existing project steering committee, which included representatives from these entities, could become a long-term advisory committee, along with other stakeholders in the area who should be involved. Second, the plan recommends that the villages explore the potential for a tax sharing agreement along for the development along the frontage on Route 31, uh, particularly focused around the small scale retail uh, envisioned in the plan. The plan calls for the villages to work with CMAP to convene a meeting to initiate a conversation around tax sharing, its benefits, and how an agreement could be established. 
Finally, the plan recommends that the villages secure funding to construct a portion of the Cary Algonquin Road side path to connect the area to downtown Algonquin. Phase one engineering has been programmed for this year already. So the village should work with McHenry County Department of Transportation to apply for construction funding. The plan highlights several avenues for construction funding, including programs that CMAP administers, like the Separate Transportation Program and the Transportation Alternative Program. Okay, um, so that was the implementation phase and uh, we talked a little bit about this before, as I mentioned, but um, in general, uh, are there thoughts on what role the committee could play in helping implement uh, local plans uh, that, that CMAP works on? So one thought that comes to my mind is, I don't know, Rick, maybe, maybe this has already happened, but I think that the members of the South Suburban Mayors and Managers Association should sort of see these examples of projects that are underway here, the, the descriptions of them. Um, mm -hmm. And through that, you'd actually touch 45 or 46 communities um, to let them know, you know, sort of the kind of work that we're doing and how we tend to approach that work. And, and you, you might be um, surprised at how educating people can also create interest and involvement. That's a great, that's a great idea. Yeah, presentation at uh, our COGS meeting, I think, would be, would be beneficial. That's a great idea. Thanks, Diane. I, I'm intrigued. Uh, I, I don't know if it's germane to the questions, but I'm a little intrigued about the the tax sharing uh, concept. Uh, are are you are they looking at uh, sharing an existing tax or creating a new revenue stream, say a business district tax uh, that they would work collaboratively on? That's a good question, I, Stephanie. I'm not sure. Do you know the the answer? Uh, I don't know. Does Dustin on the uh, call. I just don't want to take away his. If he yeah, has a I, I don't, don't think Dustin is here. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I think actually, Mayor, that it's all of the above. Uh, I think that they're sort of open to new creative financial approaches, um, and so I think that's part of what they want to explore. Uh, so they have looked at how do they share uh, existing, but also is there a new form? um you know a fee or a related that they could in, implement uh, so i think it's just the beginning of those conversations gotcha uh, if i can throw something out on that um northbrook and glenview when there was a, prop a piece of property that became commercial uh and there was rather than fighting over it they did create a tech sharing so if you're not familiar with it you could certainly explore that as well because yeah, I, I think that's a great idea. I mean, there are a lot of communities where there's one side of the street is one community and the other side of the street is the, another community. And that, I mean, it sounds like a, a perfect way to think about it to me. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it's an intriguing topic. One, one that uh, there's been discussion on in the past. Uh, but Nancy, thank you for that, because I wasn't aware of, of um, uh, any jurisdictions that have actually been successful in creating that. Yeah, and it works very well. And, and it's, well, I'm, I'm, you, you can find out. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we got some we got some earlier comments that were really great with regards to implementation. So we'll take those into account um, as well. Uh, just if there's any additional comments. Uh, one other thing I did want to just ask is um, just in general, what's your feedback on this sort of format? I know typically when we bring plans to the group, it's a you know multi uh, slide and it's, it's usually at a point where we're throwing a lot of information at you. We tried a new format with just the one slide and sort of some key points of sort of where we were and more of a snapshot. Um, and they were all under five minutes um, in, in their recording. So just also wanted some feedback on that format and if the, the committee liked maybe hearing again more about more projects, but maybe you know, just sort of more a condensed presentation. No, I, I think I think this is a great idea. Uh, having you know a project really at, at each one of our, our meetings, I think, would be beneficial. It just helps keeps us in the loop and gives all of the members an opportunity for input. And, and I would say I would say you always have the option if it's a more in depth project or or point sure. in the project to, to to do the old format. But this this does engage us in more things. Great. Very good. Okay. Great presentations. Thank you all. Thank you. So I, without it, if there are no further comments, I, uh, we'll, we'll conclude this topic and move to uh, committee updates. Uh, we have provided a link to the committee updates uh, on our webpage. Uh, these contain summary 
summaries of uh, CMAP's committee activities, and uh, this was also distributed via email. Uh, are there any additional committee updates uh, the members would like to share? Okay, great. Uh, hearing none, we will move to other business. Stephanie, is there any new business to come before our committee? There is not, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving next to uh, public comment. Uh, Stephanie, do we have any comments uh, that we've received prior or during our meeting uh, to read to the uh, members? Uh, we did not receive any comments prior to the meeting, and we also did not receive any comments in the chat box. However, anyone who did not have access to the chat box and might be joining us by phone, uh, please unmute yourself by making star six at this time if you have any comments for the Hearing none, Mr. Mayor, uh, that uh, concludes our public comment. Very, very good. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, I will note that our uh, next coordinating committee will be on September 8th at 8 a.m. Uh, perhaps we will be able to meet in person um, because hopefully we, we will be well past the restrictions of the pandemic. Um, gratefully, I think those most of those restrictions are going to be left, uh, lifted this Friday. Uh, is, is there uh, any other business uh, to come before the committee today? I do have a question, though, about the next meeting. If it is in person, are you going to have an option to call in like this? Yeah, you know, that that's a, a good question. I'd, I'd probably defer to staff. I don't know with Open Meetings Act if, if we're going to be allowed to participate remotely. And actually, that's I'm glad you brought that up, Nancy, because I, uh, something we, we may want to consider, if it's allowed, do we want to conduct these meetings remotely uh, moving forward? Uh, and maybe have every other one in person, but just something perhaps Stephanie we can we can research at the staff level uh, to see what um, what restrictions we might have under the Open Meetings Act. Yes, absolutely. We are um, looking at our policies, our CMAP policies at this time, um, with the anticipation of September being able to potentially implement a different strategy. So whether that be a hybrid strategy um, or a continuing to be a remote strategy, we will have more information with the committee over the summer. Very good. Thank you. That's a great question. Is there anything else? Okay. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate your participation. Stephanie, we had great conversation and input, I think, from our members uh, today. So I want to thank you for your support in that regard. And if there is uh, nothing else to come before the committee or any other comments, uh, we will stand adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.